Hi, I'm Phil Hill and welcome back to eLiterate TV. Today we're with Dave Cormier from the University of Prince Edward Island. And Dave, you've been around MOOCs for a while, um, all the way back in 2008. And as a matter of fact, you're credited with coining the term MOOC. Uh -huh. And you've seen various types of it. Could you describe what are the various species of MOOCs that are out there today? Well, I think they come in a number of different categories. So there's some of them that are just about teaching people the basics of things. In the industry, we call them X MOOCs, but essentially they're about sort of the basic skills in a field, like first year physics, that kind of thing. We have something else that are called C MOOCs, so they're connectivist MOOCs. They're more of a community activity where you have groups of people who are really interested and passionate getting together in communities and sharing those things. And then there's a, a bunch of different pieces on the periphery. So you've got things like Remedial MOOCs uh, is a great project in Spain that's trying to teach people chemistry and physics before they come to the university, that kind of thing. And then there's the stuff that's being done by different corporations, by different companies, some brand MOOCs you might call mm -hmm. them. And they are really about trying to get the word out about that company, but also train their clients and trade their service providers in a given thing, maybe how to do a certain kind of coding. So sure. there's different kinds across the spectrum. Sure. And one of the things is this whole field evolves as we're starting to get a little bit more of a nuanced view of what they're good for, sure. what they're not good yep. for. So with them, um, you recently wrote a very good blog post on this subject mm -hmm. about what MOOCs are good for. So given the main types, what do you see um, they're good for? Start with X MOOCs. What are X MOOCs good for in your opinion? I think an X MOOC is really good at teaching somebody, teaching those five people over there those five things. So if you have a very specific set of things that you need people to understand in order to be able to break into a field. So let's say that um, you're, let's take the physics example. Let's say that you're trying to figure out what the words mean and the different kinds of physics. I won't start giving you special topics because my physics isn't too strong. But how do you go about getting people to square one? How do you get the basic skills established? And I think. An X MOOC is really good at that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. When you get to something like a C MOOC, it's really good at complexity. So let's say that we have all the HR professionals in a country like Canada, and we want to get them to the point where they think better and they're, they're more aware of mental health issues. Well, it's not like there's one, two, three mental health issues they have to pay attention to. They all have different experiences, and in sharing those experiences with each other, learning with each other, developing a community of practice with each other, that CMOOC can really help those people get to the next level, not really those five people learning those five things, but a community coming together to sure. grow better. Mm -hmm. And what about, uh, you've written and talked about brand MOOCs as mm -hmm. well. Where do you see, uh, what, what problem do those solve? I think that a lot of companies out there are trying to educate their clients so that they better understand the product that they're coming for. And they're also, like the example that I, I was working with in 2012, um, it's called the Summer of Learning was their project. Sure. It's expanded to five or six projects, now, five or six courses now. And it's a company called Aquin, it's a communications company. And they have a very special kind of problem. They have a thousand different service providers, let's say, but a number of them who all do a certain kind of work for them, in this case, computer coding. They need all of their providers to become better at computer coding. Yeah. And they need all of their service clients to better understand the product that they're doing. So they offer a free course. 10,000 people take it. They get seen as a valuable member of the overall community. More people get to know about them as a company. They get a better positive brand message. Sure. And then they educate all these people and, and really do good work too, so they can write it off as a positive community <laughs> activity. So it works in all those places and it works for everybody, which is a really nice thing too. Sure. Now, those are all, th those three different cases you've mentioned are mm -hmm. quite different in yes, terms absolutely. of what the learner population is and mm -hmm. what they're trying to achieve. What are the common threads that you see between them or are these just very distinct categories? I think when we start talking about MOOCs, the key thing to understand, and the difference between it and another online course you may have taken, is a MOOC is about abundance. So the massive part and the open part is about there being lots and lots of things that are shared. So in the first part, when you talk about an X MOOC learning basic skills, what you have is you could have 100 people, physicists from all over the country, and working on a project like right now with, with edX and MIT on this, but to develop a core physics textbook, network textbook, written by all the experts in the country, but in one place that everybody can take. So you have the massiveness of all these experts and then millions of people potentially taking the same course. And there's something really powerful about that and a really powerful leveraging of the abundance provided by the internet. When you look at a C MOOC with a connectivist MOOC, 
you have a chance of having, like the HR professionals example, that abundance of people's perspectives, of different perspectives, perspectives you may not have thought about, may not have expected, all contributing to the curriculum of a conversation. And when you look at the brand piece, they could spend millions of dollars uh, on advertising and all these sort of other traditional approaches and not necessarily know well, who they've reached and how they've reached them. Whereas if you have 10,000 people sign up for a specific course and go through it, you not only have engaged them, but you know who they are, you know the kinds of things they do, and you start to learn things about, in that case, both your providers and your clients, you couldn't learn any other way. And in all three of those cases, the abundance is really the thing that you're leveraging. Sure. And so uh, just a quick question about looking forward, like mm -hmm. do you see the field sort of spreading out into more and more different categories or do you see a sort of consolidating in the near future on what the primary types of MOOCs are going to be? Oh, I think that what we're going to find is that abundance is going to spread. Okay. So as people start to realize the power of that and they start to realize that taking the content, charging people for content is going to become increasingly difficult. Sure. As it becomes more and more abundant and more and more available, as companies are willing to pay to create content so they can give it away for other reasons, it's going to be harder and harder to use that business model and more and more people are going to think, you know, if we create this relationship with people by sharing who we are, we're going to get further than we were before. And I think you're going to see more and more creative ways of doing that. One more other side impact that I'm just starting to see happen mm -hmm. is where you have specific subcultures or smaller cultures coming together to use MOOCs to be able to find a position on the internet. So if you look in Sweden right now, they have a course that they're running for educational technologists, but in Swedish. Okay. Because there were no resources built in Swedish online. You see the same thing in Spain with Spanish resources, and then they're working with the entire Spanish-speaking population of the world, but trying to create a Spanish subsection. And you could have the same thing. I mean, you do see those things on places like online discussion forums, and sure. those have been building for years. This is a more formalized approach to this, and I think increasingly you're going to see more sub-communities coming together to create these kind of resources for the rest of the community. And I want to thank Dave Cormier. I appreciate you being with us here today. Thanks, Phil.